Justin Goodbread, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited to have a nice conversation. Uh, you have a lot of experience in the world of business and starting your own business and, and owning businesses. Uh, we're going to be exploring how to leverage the people of organizations, the human capital in a successful business and how you want to leverage human capital when building your business. As we get started, I wanted to share Justin's bio with everybody. Justin A. Goodbread, <coughs> excuse me, let me try that again. Justin A. Goodbread is owner of Heritage Investors LLC, Heritage Business Advisors and FinanciallySimple.com, is a nationally recognized financial educator, wealth manager, author, speaker, and entrepreneur. He has 20 plus years of experience starting, buying, owning, and selling businesses. Justin is a four-time recipient of the Investitopia Top 100 Advisor Award and the Exit Planning Institute, Institute's Exit Planner Leader of the Year. Wonderful background. Uh, and I think you'll bring in a nice, unique perspective to the conversation today. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? So, John, we had this really cool thing that happened with my newest book, Your Baby's Ugly. It reached number one on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we, it was pretty cool to see your name, my name above like Glenn Beck and a couple of senators out there and some pretty prominent people. So I know we're going to talk about some of the content of Your Baby's Ugly, but number one, man, on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. That was pretty cool to see. Yeah, that, that is awesome. Congratulations. And maybe we can start there. Uh, tell us just a little bit about the book. And the title of the book isn't something necessarily people would like jump to as that's a business book. So tell us um, the connection there and why this is for leaders. Sure. So the title of the book is Your Baby's Ugly. And it was a comment that my dad made whenever he was alive many times. He would say, son, you never tell a woman their baby's ugly. But if you do, and sometimes you have to, you better run or duck because they're going to come after you, right? So the, the consensus is, is that we as business owners or managers or those in leadership within business, we take a lot of pride in our business, our department, our division, everything that we pour our literal blood, sweat, and tears into. And somehow in the course of our tenure, whether we're the owner of the business or a manager, somebody's going to come along that's going to, in so many ways, call our baby ugly. It may be a buyer who's going to try to buy our business is going to look at it as an investor and they don't see, they don't have all that, that goodwill built up and they're looking at pure data points and they're saying, oh man, your marketing's not very good or your people, the team is, you know, they're aging versus a younger gen, uh, demographic or if we're talking about your team, you don't have good credentials on your bench of your employees or whatever the, the, the position is they're looking at. And whenever we're doing analysis for business owners, I start talking to managers of divisions. I start offering questions or ideas around operational efficiency. And then we, we burl up, you know, like an old dog that's just mad at somebody's coming on their property or messing with their bone. We start, you know, taking a lot of offense to this thing that we've poured our blood, sweat, and tears into. And so the book is around that premise that we as business owners, you may put it as a manager of a division inside there, but we put so much stock into our baby, whatever that baby is, that candidly, we don't step outside the bubble and look at our baby the way an investor or a board of directors or a supervisor or somebody else would. And so we dissect the business industry down into eight key areas and start asking questions around how we can improve the value of the business through those eight areas like people and operation, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And yeah, it's kind of a funny thing. Obviously you never tell someone their baby's ugly. Um, you know, I've had actually funny conversations around that whole, that topic with family members as well. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's people chuckling uh, on the other side of, you know, listening to this. Uh, so that's, that's a wonderful premise for the title of your book. And again, kudos on the success of the book. And I encourage listeners to check it out. Um, now, the other piece of that that you said, though, is, is we do have to be willing to take the hard feedback. We have to be willing to listen to what people are saying, um, because sometimes we are a little bit blinded uh, to, you know, the, the work that we're doing because it's our baby, because it's something we put our blood, sweat and tears into. Uh, so we, we have to be clear eyed about that. And we have to keep people around us who can be clear eyed about that and, and where we have a culture where people can speak up. Um, 
where we're not insulated from that kind of feedback, but where people will feel, uh, feel comfortable and empowered to speak up and to speak out and point out problems uh, before they become huge problems. And so whether that's someone internal to the company, your, your executive team, people that surround you on your team, uh, or it's external stakeholders of, of different varieties, uh, or just your people, uh, that's, that's a really important piece. Be willing to be able to accept uh, and, and really you know, put, put that uh, feedback to work to help you get better, to help your, uh, your business be more successful. And now one of the, the pillars that you were talking about is the people. There's so many different things that business leaders need to be thinking about and all these different priorities. Clearly, there's so many different assets and forms of capital that are essential to the success of a business. One of those important pieces, though, is the HR, the human capital, the human asset in the organization. And if you can't fully leverage the human capital, uh, it's going to be really hard to have a, a long-term sustainable, su successful business, no matter how good the idea is, uh, no matter how, you know, the quality or the, 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 the value that the product or service brings to the market, you got to have good people to deliver it, to produce it and to interact with customers. Otherwise you're just not going to have a sustainable business model. And, and sometimes organizations forget that because they're so focused on many of these other important pillars that are also you know, very uh, important. So how do we make sure that, especially as we're building our business, as we're growing our business, how do we make sure that we're giving enough time and attention to the human capital piece, you know, while balancing with the other priorities? You know, it all comes down to value and where is the value of the company today? And if you can get the owner or the managers aligned on value growth in the company, increasing the enterprise value of the organization, then you backwards engineer into your human capital answer. What, what, what I often see happens, John, is this, is that the company is so focused on profitability or margin or top line revenue or sales or whatever term you want to use there. Maybe it's EBIT or EBITDA within your organization. Maybe it's EBOC, earnings before owner's compensation. I've seen it all within whatever industry you're in. But oftentimes management or owners focus on on a quantifiable data point that ends up driving the value down. It ends up hurting the value. Um, if you look at the, the market, you'll see companies out there which have high stock prices right now. And if you were to simply do a book value calculation, the book value calculation of some of your highest blue chip companies do not calculate to the current share price of the stock. So what's happening is, is these companies are doing a reduction of company specific risk. They're reducing the risk of the company. If we're looking at that mindset saying, okay, how am I going to reduce the risk of the company and therefore drive the value of the company up or the share price of the company up? One of those areas is, the, is directly the people part of the company. It doesn't do a company any good to have retention issues or attrition issues or a confused workforce or confused management. I often, I, I like to watch football. My team that I've watched my whole life is the Georgia Bulldogs. Finally, they win the national championship. I'm 43 years old. And it's like, finally, and since today's a Herschel Walker, we finally have this, this underdog who wins literally the national championship. You know, they would have never been able to win that championship had the running backs and wide receivers not known the plays in detail not known the, what was the goal they were trying to score on, what the mission of the overall organization has been for 40 years, which is to win that championship. But yet in business, so many times, higher up, the owner, management, don't delineate down in simple format what a win is for the company, what the mission is for the company what the vision is. And, and I know we get into leadership issues there. And I got to tell you, I, I consult with business owners nationally and they always I say, hey, show me your vision and mission. Great. And they have it somewhere stuck in a drawer somewhere. And then I get to talking with their team and I'm like, hey, what's the vision of this company? And they're like crickets. They don't say anything. So if, if we're going to deal with HR, we've got to realize it's our human capital. It's not just hiring good people. It is. We have to have the best talent. We have to have the best pedigree for our industry. We have to have the dream team, like the old basketball players of the, the whenever I was a child, watching them dominate the, the industry or the, the sport. We've got to have the dream team of players. And as Jim Collins says, yes, we got to get the right people on the bus. We got to get in the right seat. Everybody quotes that statement over and over again. But it boils down much more than that. It boils down to can we get every person fighting 
for the same output, for the same simple goal, the same simple goal. In every area of life, whether it's religion, politics, sports, whatever it is, it always boils down to one common goal. But in business, we often complicate it. We complicate it. We make it to where it's about many goals. We want this division to outroll a new product. We want this division to cut, to cut expenses. We want this division to hire, the, to hire a new superstar salesperson. We want to go out and acquire this, this company. But why? Why? Where are we headed and how do we get there? So, John, the, the one thing I see in operations in terms of people, the HR component, is there's a disconnect from how each individual's person's role helps the company win. There's an old proverb that says where your treasure is, where your money is, your heart's going to be there, right? And the reason oftentimes that we have such attrition or we don't have buy-in or we have what's called the iceberg of ignorance from the, from the, from the uh, executive level is that we haven't simplified the cause of the business or the vision of the business down to not trying to be degrading, but rank and file from through all levels of the industry. And the company that secures that wins. Uh, there's this, there's this chicken sandwich I love that's produced by Chick-fil-A. I don't know if you've ever had it before. Chick-fil-A makes this amazing chicken sandwich. And whenever you drive through the drive-thru, you go there, you're going to say, thank you. Like most people would thank you for your, for helping me with this. And they're going to instantly say, it's my pleasure. Why is that? Because that's the value that permeates down even to the 16 year old who can barely pass their math exam knows that the vision and the mission of that one company is not to deliver the best chicken sandwich. It's to provide a customer experience that's, hey, it's our pleasure to serve you. So brother, as we're working in business, whether we're the owners or the managers or the original divisional directors, we have to make sure that we first know clearly where we're headed and why. And then we've got to be able to motivate and to encourage and to incentivize the people within our purview, within our, the, our direct support to reach that goal. Very, very well said and articulated. And I have a daughter, I have a 16 year old daughter that works at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> um, awesome. And you're absolutely right. Like that's, that's uh, the focus of what, of what they uh, really try to, to drill into their people. And they want to have a good customer experience. I have another, I have an 18 year old daughter that works at In-N-Out and similar story. Um, you know, they, they put a lot of time and energy and focus in developing their young employees to provide good customer experience. And regardless of what you're doing, you may not be fast food, that's fine. <laughs> uh, whatever you're doing though, you know, you got to invest in your people enough to share that, that vision, that mission of what you're trying to accomplish and let them understand that. It doesn't need to be super complicated. Well, um, and the cool thing is, John, is as, is as if we understand the vision mission, then everything stems from that. So as you hire somebody, you're able to hire the right people that buy into the vision, mission, the values of the organization. Exactly. As you yep. do the, the quarterly meetings or the monthly meetings or the weekly meetings, whatever it is you're doing within your company, you can now hold that, that particular goal as the centerpiece, as the linchpin, as the cornerstone of every individual meeting. Whenever you have a team member that goes awry from the vision and mission, you have something that you can use to bring them back to that potential, particular central point. Now, the, the danger is this. It's so simple. It's so simple, kind of like diet and exercise. It's so simple that we don't do it. And, and I, I get so frustrated at these, these coaches that come out of the corporate world and they talk about vision and mission. And I, as a small business owner, as someone who sold six businesses now, who's someone who, who deals with business owners nationally, I get so tired of vision and mission. But if we're talking about people, if you have not secured your vision, your mission, and the values on how you're going to operate the company, nothing else matters. If you, anytime I see a company that has high attrition, anytime I see a company that has compensation struggles, that has sales struggles, that has, you name it, conflict internally. I have, we have one we call the hen house where everybody fusses at each other internally. It all comes back to vision, mission, and values every single time. And so if you have a problem with people, I can tell you have a problem with your vision, mission, and values. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. Like I'm in this space. I think vision, mission, values are super important, but I completely agree with you that so much of the time we just give lip service to it and we, yeah. we spin our wheels, we churn, we pump out a really nice wordsmith statement 
and then it doesn't actually mean anything and, and everyone knows that and and nobody really knows what it is it's not reinforced there's no mechanisms of how it's integrated into the the organization and so vision mission value super super important as you're trying to tap into the potential of your your human capital within the organization but you got to actually mean it you actually have so to consistently let's take work it to the, it. let's well let's take it to the second step then Okay, because everybody says we need to have vision, mission, values, right? So let's say you do have it. It hasn't been lip service. We haven't wordsmithed something, right? So now we have it. And we truly, this is the direction. This is what I remember one political candidate who said, we will win. And then they define what that win was, right? So we, 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 we will win in our business. And we define what that win is. We, everybody knows that the championship ring is what we're after. Whatever it is, whatever analogy you want to use there for your particular position. Great. you got your vision, mission, values done, top drawer sealed up. Cool. Everything you do from that point now has to point to that. So now when you hire people, you got to hire people that have the right personality profiles for the position they're in. That's going to support the vision, mission, values. As you manage people, you're managing people through very detailed job descriptions, criteria for performance reviews that govern, that's governed by the vision, mission, values. As you acquire another division as you acquire another company and you're wanting to absorb that team into your organization. Great. You're going to do your assessments. You're going to do Myers-Briggs or DISC or hire some fancy company out there, do a true personality profile to make sure that person is, is the right person to be on the bus using Jim Collins analogy again, but it's going to be couched against vision, mission, values. As you design compensation structures, whether it's a incentive-based compensation, whether it's team-based bonus structure, individualized, whether it's above market compensation that you're trying to pay people to retain them, whether it's below market, you're trying to incentivize, whatever your compensation structure, which aligns with your sales and marketing division is going to be couched into, does that compensation match the values and the vision you're going forward? So even though we do give a lot of lip service, and even though I like to berate the corporate types who come out and preach vision, mission, and values, and that we do understand the importance of it. It's not something that we can couch out. Every system within the company, every process within the HR, the hiring, the firing, the management, the advancement, the organizational structure, the leadership team working, working as uh, only five subverts underneath one key person, you know, making sure you have the right organizational structure in place, all has to be in alignment with vision, mission, values. And where the breakdown is that I see, and I see it over and over and over again, is not the knowledge. It's not the knowledge that we should have vision, mission, values. It's not the knowledge that we should have the right compensation structure, the right benefit package, the right hiring process, the right firing process. I read a cool, cool book called The Dream Manager, helping your, even your team look at where they can aspire through the company and even outside the company. I love how Gary Vaynerchuk often says that, hey, we should be training our employees to where they want to leave. We should be in an incubation house. All that is good. And we have the knowledge to do it where we, where we lack is application. We don't connect each one of these individual subsects of the HR or the employees to the overarching theme, vision, mission, values. We realize if we're looking at a chessboard that we have, we have rooks and pawns and bishops and knights and queens and everything else on there. And each one of them have a position to play, but what is the overall mission as checkmate? And it's all designed for that one position. And so where the disconnect is, is not knowledge. The old saying goes, knowledge without application leads to stagnation. It's like the green pond that we see as we pass a cow pasture in the country. It's just green because it's stagnant. The same thing happens in our business because we have the knowledge and we may have some of these things in a drawer, but until we blend them together and apply them, we're stagnant. And that's what I candidly John, I see in businesses. And it doesn't matter if they're micro businesses doing 1 million, 2 million a year, or if it's a $200 million a year revenue business, I see them all. And it's always stagnation because of application. It's too easy. It's like diet and exercise. It's too easy until we meet the doctor and he says, hey, you have some issues. You've been diet and exercise all these years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> excuse me, as you as you're so clearly articulated, we need to have this embedded throughout the organization. We have to have systems and processes that will reinforce the mission, the vision, mission, and value of the organization, do it consistently over time. And when we're not doing that, inevitably, you know, we're going to end up making bad hiring decisions. We're going to make 
bad promotion decisions. We're going to incentivize the wrong behaviors. <laughs> We're just going to do all the things, uh, the simple little things wrong consistently um, that will lead us down the wrong path. And something you said at the very beginning, you know, you have all these different things when you're going to look at investing in a business or, or buying a business or trying to sell your business and trying to look good um, when you're doing it. You know, there's so many different things you, want, you need to consider. But one of the really important elements is What's the, the status of your human capital? Uh, how solid are you? How good are your processes? Um, how, how developed are your people? Uh, and what do they bring to the table? And that adds tremendous value to the business. And if you can't demonstrate that, if you can't show that, you're going to have a much harder time uh, as you're trying to convey that to potential investors or buyers or, or whatever. Or if I'm buying a, a company, or trying to merge with a company, I'm going to be way more hesitant if if I see all sorts of uh, human capital problems. So here's here's if I get down to the root or the ethos of this matter, here's how I like to pose a question to business owners or managers whenever I'm consulting with them, and that is this: We all want our business to be highly valuable and highly profitable. That's a given, uh, but I have to just couch it with that statement. The question becomes: Is is your business or is your division, if you're a manager, is it best in class? In other words, if I were to take your business and I were to, let's put, let's put a face on this example. Let's say that you're a dentist or let's say that, uh, let's use a car repair company because everybody has a car pretty much. Let's say that you're a car repair company. If I were to compare your company, a car repair company to every other company out there that's doing the exact same revenue, has about the same size store and I were investing in it, would I look at your manager as a best-in-class manager? In other words, could they go to the national convention and teach other managers how to manage a best-in-class business? Let's take it a step further. Let's say now we're using an auto repair company. Let's say you got somebody just doing a lube change, just changing the oil, making sure your tire pressure's up, changing the filters. I mean, we've all seen the Jiffy Lube or the quick service lanes at Walmart or wherever. Let's say we just take something that is an entry level position, but yet you have a, somebody in your business that can do loop changes at, an, at a ridiculous rate. They're doing where most people are doing at six cars an hour, they're doing nine cars an hour, and they have a quality control that has zero complaints. Can that person go to the national convention and teach others? See, if we take our minds from the inside the bubble analysis of our business and we looked at every individual person, could that person in their role, whatever it may be for your company, could they go to a national convention of their peers and teach the others how to be exceptional? Only when we realize that every person on our bench has to be an all-star, they have to be a dream team. Well, we realize the power and the intangible asset value of human capital. Friends, I, I, I appraise, I can appraise businesses left and right. I've, like I said, I've started and sold businesses. I've sold six businesses. I've looked at tons of appraisals. And there are four capitals, one of them being human capital. And the human capital component if you have a dream team, if you have the Dennis Rodman, the Michael Jordan, the Larry Bird, and they're out there dominating the basketball court, if you have that on your bench, you're going to demand a higher multiple, a higher value in your company. Not only that, you're going to see higher profits. You're also going to see lower stress as an owner. You've decentralized yourself from the company. Everything that we want as the golden goose is hinged upon vision, mission, values. But if you put the rubber on the road and you ask yourself this hard question is, can every person on my team go to a national convention and their peers, their equal peers within your other organizations, look at them and say, wow, you've got a superstar. You got a super stud is whatever you want to say there. This is the person. If you don't have that, then we all as business owners, as managers to us should aspire to get the right people, the best in class people on our bus. So whenever we go get God's sandwich, this Chick-fil-A sandwich, we actually hear him say, my pleasure. Very well said, Justin. This has just been a real pleasure. I really appreciate your time, your insights that you've shared with me and my listeners. Before we wrap up, I need to let you go here in just a minute. I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, where they can find your book, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. 
Sure. So you can check out Financially Simple. We have a blog and a podcast that we try to teach business owners, managers how to dominate the marketplace. There's over 200 hours, I think, right now, a podcast and uh, thousands of articles. The books, Your Your Baby's Ugly and the Ultimate Sale are on Amazon um, and Kindle, audio version, et cetera. So you can find it there. I, I think it's the final word is, look, is that life has been hard these last couple of years. We've gone through a tremendous amount of turmoil um, in leadership. It's been very dynamic. It's not been status quo. If we take a sila, an old Hebrew word just means to pause for a second. We just pause. And we realize that everybody within our, that we're managing, every person, human capital, wakes up in the morning and they say, I want to give my best. I've yet to meet a person that says, I want to be mediocre. I've yet to meet a person that says, I'm out here to try to mess somebody up. Genuinely, they want to do their best because they want to aspire to be their best. I had to believe that. I think we all would agree that that is the consensus of the majority. It's up to us to help identify what is their best as managers. And can we align their best, whatever it may be, with the best of the responsibilities as managers and business owners that we have before us? And if we can create a harmony and a symbiotic relationship where the best of our team and the best of our companies, our divisions can align, then we won this human capital game and it will be recognized. Very well said, Justin. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Justin can do for you. Check out the books. And as always, please, as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. You can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.